Uh, my name is Kim Loper. I am an executive officer of the program committee for this conference, and I'm also the interim associate dean for health science information services at the University of Miami. Um, I am pleased to have you join the poster session this afternoon. And before we again, for those who haven't been here yet, I appreciate your patience and understanding as we are bringing this conference to both in-person and virtual attendees. We are working hard to make sure this is a seamless experience for all. Please note this poster session is being transmitted via Zoom through Feedloop. The presenters will have their turns presenting and at the end of all the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session. Those viewing through Feedloop, please feel free to use the question and answer chat function and we will have our in-person Feedloop moderator ask questions on your behalf. So because the poster sessions are only five minutes long and given the time constraints, I will not be introducing all the speakers with an in-depth bio. They will join us either on stage or virtually in the, in, well, it says in the order listed on the program, but we're actually changing that up because if we go in the order listed on the program, we've got to stop sharing and restarting every time. So we're going to go with all on-site participants first, and then we're gonna to go to the virtual participants. Everyone will have five minutes, and I will give you a 30 second time notice. So please ensure that you um, wrap up as quickly as you can once you hear that 30 second time notice, because we wanna be conscious of everybody else's time. Our first presenter is Library Research and Adobe Scholars, Lifelong Learning Through Mentoring. Welcome to the stage. Thank you, Kim. Hello, my name is Ava Brilla. I'm the Program Lead for Information Literacy and Instructional Design, and I have the pleasure of presenting to you our poster entitled uh, Library Research and Adobe Scholars, Lifelong Learning Through Mentoring with my colleagues, Lauren Freilinger, Education and Arts and Sciences Librarian, and Vanessa Rodriguez, head of Creative Studio. Um, uh, all three of us co-manage the Library Research and Adobe Scholars Program, which is a librarian faculty mentored learning experience in which undergraduate students research, propose, and execute an independent project resulting in shareable deliverables. Our intention is to foster lifelong learning skills amongst our students in the hopes that they leave us identifying themselves as scholars. Each accepted undergraduate is matched with a library faculty member who mentors the student on discipline-specific research skills, although it is the student that leads the research process. So what does this program look like? We start soliciting applications in winter and early spring to choose the cohort of students for the next academic year. Currently, our cohort is comprised of five students, three library research scholars, and two Adobe scholars. Although we have a shared curriculum for all students, Adobe scholars do receive training on Adobe creativity programs in the hopes that they are able to incorporate these tools into their research project. And Vanessa Rodriguez acts as an additional mentor to these students. Um, uh, let's see. The main reason for this distinction between our library research scholars and our Adobe scholars comes in part from our funding. So our three library research scholars are funded by UM Libraries budget, whereas funding for the Adobe scholars comes from an endowment established with funds from our Adobe Creative Campus licensure. So in the fall and the spring semesters, the entire cohort meets weekly to complete a semester's, uh, that semester's curriculum. In the fall, our beginning semester, the curriculum focuses on information literacy, including developing viable research questions and determining, locating, and accessing information needed to continue their research project development. Students are also introduced to experts and resources within the UM libraries to support their fluency in research. The bulk of the project creation occurs in the spring semester. Uh, scholars still meet regularly to finesse their research and, and, uh, uh, and to receive needed skills training. However, the focus of the spring semester is on the collaborative nature of research and learning. Scholars routinely share their progress with their peers, give and receive feedback to strengthen their research and their confidence. By the end of the spring semester, scholars complete their research project as well as a full six page annotated bibliography and the finalized version of their research proposal. 
Uh, so if I had to distill our work into just a few talking points, I would break these two points into two different groups. Uh, for those of you who are interested in creating an undergraduate research program at your own library, here are some salient points to take away with you. Um, establishing an undergraduate research program within the libraries is a great uh, place, venue for building on those lifelong learning skills. Um, there's absolutely space for inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility work within undergraduate research programs. So each year, at least one of our scholars focuses on equity and inclusion in their research projects, focusing on underrepresented voices, experiences, and resources. And that also makes our library stronger. Um, our focus on the research projects being student-led allows our program to be complementary to other research programs on campus where students may not act as uh, the lead. I think this gives us an edge and helps us establish a unique opportunity within our own uh, university community. And then finally, our library faculty mentors come from all over the libraries, not just within our reference and instruction department. I truly believe that this helps us build community and rapport within our libraries and gives our students a more well-rounded experience. Uh, for those of you that already have established undergraduate research programs, I've got a couple of insights for you as well. Um, so due to the freedom that our students have within our program, the annotated bibliographies and those research project proposals are the common element that all scholars create, regardless of what they decide that format of their final project to be. We ask students to deposit these two pieces in our scholarly repository in order to create some form of documentation of their work. We use the ACRL framework for information literacy as the groundwork for those weekly curriculum sessions, and the framework provides those learning objectives that help connect each session to the larger purpose of the program. We also rely on uh, the ACRL roles and strengths of teaching librarians document to help our, our librarian faculty members establish their role in the work that they do with our students because they truly do so, so much. Um, if I had to make a change to this program, I would establish a budget to compensate uh, uh, our mentors and then also to expand to uh, let many different levels of student skill uh, into our, our program. I have in no way touched upon everything in our poster, and I'm a rather poor representation, especially for, for my two colleagues. Uh, so I will leave by encouraging you to reach out to us with any questions, take a look at our poster, anything that's interesting to you, please ask us and we'll be happy to answer. Uh, thank you so much. And I will let leave the student the podium for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. So our next topic is Epic O European Print Initiatives Collaboration in the Seventh QPO Conference, September 2022, Vienna. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have a question. Who has had a problems with space, with the connection in this library. I have a problem with space. And we, we will probably know my poster because EPICO, EPICO is a, a European print initiative collaboration. Uh, it's a, a, an informal network of 17 European participants who manage national or regional initiative for preserving printed materials. We know that printed materials is also important in the heart of each librarian. And the initiative includes repository libraries for the storage of print materials like uh, high density libraries and collaborative journal preservation program. I manage in my manage in Belgium a program for sharing a uh, collection of periodicals, papers, uh, between six universities uh, with a final goal to conserve only one uh, collection for the six. And we share this collection. And for this reason, I am in this group. And we organized uh, since 1999 uh, the QOPO conference. QOPO is the name of the first conference uh, city in Finland. And this conference will uh, be organized in September. September is the end uh, of the summer in Vienna. And we, 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 like, we like to go in Vienna in the end of the summer. It's one of the most beautiful city in Europe. And uh, we invite you to come at this, uh, come at this uh, conference um, in September. And what are the themes, the, the topics of this uh, conference is review and renew, changing strategies in collection management. We have uh, three keynotes. Do we even want to keep prints? It's a question. 
the project of the UK national, uh, the UK national project about uh, shared collection and, uh, and financial topics about the consumption between print and electronic paper uh, documents. We have seven sessions, one of the about global uh, perspectives, sorry, uh, achieving policy of publishers, metadata, uh, the national libraries that are uh, involved in the program, and preservation policy for shared archiving, archiving initiative. I manage this, uh, I'm chairman of this, uh, this project. You have to know that um, there are no call for papers. We invite specialists in each domain. And for example, in my uh, session, we have invited uh, Gregory Eo from the Center for the Research Library uh, from America. And then we have also uh, the most important is the economic value and evaluation of the printed materials and their perspective in the, in the budget of libraries and the project uh, seance, a session about storing and access, I apologize. Well, we invite you to this conference. It's not expensive, but it's far. And uh, each uh, two or three years, we have more than 300 or 40, 400 participants from all over the, over the world. There are visitors also uh, in the city of Vienna uh, during the social program. It's you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speakers, if they're here, are the Academic Library as a Meeting Space, Story Time for the Recreational Room of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. University, Universidad de la República, Uruguay. We'll move on to the next speaker. They may have joined us virtually. Our next speaker, Faculty Open Access Perceptions, a Quantitative Analysis. Good afternoon, everyone, and hi to everybody that's joining online. My name is Cara Jones. I'm University Librarian at the American University of Sharjah. And this is my colleague, Dr. Janice Lusk. She's a professor, professor of sociology also at the American University of Sharjah. We ran a survey in February to March 2020, just before the pandemic hit, where we wanted to find out more about our faculty perceptions on open access. Now we've all been there in every library, we want, we want to know a bit more about what our faculty think. We wanted to know more because we felt they weren't really engaging with open access, and we just wanted to know why. Did they think it was an issue? What, was it, there's still this kind of assumption that there was predatory practices? So this is a survey that we did that so tried to get under the skin of our faculty to find out what they what they thought. So I'm going to hand over to Janice, and she's going to tell you about the survey instrument itself. All right. So um, we reached out to all AUS faculty, researchers, and staff, um, just in case you know anyone was a researcher that may not have identified as faculty, um, and. Basically, they just had to have an affiliation with AUS, um, give their consent and be 18 and older. Uh, we got a response rate of 29.3%, um, and the completion rate was actually 85%, which was really good, actually. Um, and so we had an N of 134. And so the survey, which we constructed along with our colleagues, um, two other librarians that also worked on the project with us, um, covered four areas. One one's position on open access publishing overall, um, two, publishing behaviors and interests, and then also familiarity with OA publishing methods um, and experience with OA publishing. Um, so if you look at the first figure on the upper left um, side, um, this is showing you the position on OA publishing by percent. And uh, primarily the majority are either strongly in favor or moderately in favor of open access publishing about 18% that were neutral, um, and about 4% only that were not in favor. But we focused on that slight ambiguity in the middle of about 50% who are moderately in favor or who were neutral. Um, we also found, uh, if you look at the figure two, uh, top right, um, previous experience matters. Um, those who published in OA are, of course, more likely to be in favor of OA at about 90%. Um, 
So 90% in favor versus only 54% uh, among those who haven't published in OA. Um, and in the bottom left corner, you can see there are some selected um, items given there um, that those in favor had a more rational perception um, and more positive interpretations of OA. Um, they were more likely to see it as a principled alternative to traditional publishing, um, that it might increase likelihood of citations, that it's peer reviewed um, often, um, you know, that there are less restrictions and things like that. Um, and then finally, in the lower right corner, um, we see the position on, on OA publishing by quality perception. And actually, this one, it, it shouldn't be in the bar that shows that it totals 100. Um, so those are independent percentages there. Um, but for the most part, um, it seems like the people who are in favor that are that blue uh, uh, portion um, have a really even kill like understanding of OA. Um, where they see that it is similar to quality in, tradition, in traditional publishing um, versus thinking that it's either higher quality or lower quality. But of course, those who are not in favor um, or those who are neutral um, believe that it's lower quality. Okay, so we do have a kind of unique environment because we didn't have any funder mandates or institutional mandates for open access and we didn't have an open access fund. So since the survey has completed, we've had an institutional open access fund that our research office is controlling, and that started to fan out, fan out amongst faculty. So they're becoming more and more aware of open access publishing and opportunities it provides. We have um, a colleague who started with us as a scholarly communications librarian, and that's made, made a big difference. She's able to um, go out there and interact with, with faculty. She's had a research impact challenge, and so all of these things are things that we have been able to put together and think about because of the results that we've had from our, our faculty. The big thing has been the predatory publisher kind of tag, which we've all dealt with for a really long time. But this is um, something we're addressing through different workshops and libguides. Okay, still work to be done as the, was the end product of our survey. Thank you. I think babies should, all, all, all people should bring a baby up at this stage because how could you not just be thoroughly engaged with that? So our next, I thought we had one more this person. Okay, they went virtual, they're out with us. So we're gonna, we're gonna move to the virtual order. And our first virtual participant is Zooming into breakout rooms for engaging library instruction sessions. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, since we only have five minutes, I'm going to talk about um, how, when we moved in online during the pandemic, how I re-envisioned library instruction online in order to save myself, let alone the students. You know, when we do library instruction in a face-to-face -face environment, we can gauge the audience by seeing if they've left the room mentally, if they're staring off in space, or maybe looking right at us, but um, maybe a glaze over their eyes, or perhaps they're on their device or something like that. And we can walk around the room, change the intonation of our voice, or ask a question to bring them back into the room mentally. Um, in the online environment, it's very different. Um, at our institution, many of the students do not turn on the camera during library instruction. Um, so we don't know if they've left the room not only mentally, but also physically. So um, as a way, Oops, how do I go to the next slide? There. Oh, this is who I am. I'm Sarah Hamill. So as a way to re-engage the students online and also to prevent myself from talking to myself, which I do all the time, um, I um, set it up to have the students do group work in Zoom breakout rooms. And also another reason is I know this quote it brings really true for me. Um, I may get frustrated looking for the answer, um, but I remember the process a lot more than if someone tells me the answer. So basically the setup is I do an introduction, I, I give a quick overview of the library resources and services, and primarily how to get help if they need help afterwards. And then um, I explain to them that they will be working in groups in the Zoom breakout rooms, um, and that they will each have a unique um, activity to do or learn about a resource and share that with the rest of the class. They will be doing a presentation at the end. 
I use Google Docs. And the type of activities, of course, depends on the course, the instruction request, or the time. I have done the Zoom breakout rooms with classes from 55 minutes up to three hours. Of course, during the three hour class, I don't leave them in the breakout rooms for three hours. It really just takes about five to 10 minutes for the breakout rooms. Um, and these are just some sample questions for uh, English composition class. I'm gonna go quickly through these. Of course, it depends on the class that you are teaching. If you are teaching English composition, you might teach the, tell them to explain how to get to the library catalog, how to get to a specific database. If you were, for example, I'm a business librarian, you would teach Business Source Complete and other business databases. Um, one thing I do emphasize to the students is I give them instruction how to get to the database or the resource that and so they should when they do their presentations they explain how to get there what kind of information they can find in the database and when they would use it and do a sample search for everybody can see how to use it um, i always in every class regardless of level um, teach google or have them teach google versus google scholar versus the library because we all use google right um, but many students still do not know about google scholar and they don't know how to connect Google Scholar to the library. So I make sure to emphasize how to make that connection between Google Scholar and the library resources. Um, without using library lingo, one student, one group will always um, show and, how to search with and. One group will always show how to search with or. Um, at least one group will show how to do peer review research. And then I will ask them, what is a peer reviewed article? And if they can explain what it is, I will jump in and give them an explanation. And each group and each resource that they, they share with the rest of the group, with the rest of the class, shows how to cite, email, and save the information. Um, and then for the group presentations, they take over the Zoom room and they show to the rest of the class what they learned. And this is where I jump in, I might ask questions, um, and I explain to them that I'm gonna maybe ask a question that's not on your, your instructions what to do in order to um, share other information that might be relevant to you. And then at the end, I always leave time for a wrap up. The reason being is that sometimes the students go in a direction that I would hope that they would go in a different direction so I can redirect them to the information. Um, and I do a quick assessment. Tell me one database that you learned about. Um, tell me what, how, um, give me a sample search using and. Um, 30 seconds and so on and so forth and I'll say thank you for this one and I think I'm next right again yes Sarah you're next okay. and the title of this presentation is going to be weaving the library's future beyond traditional activities so thank you again um, I'm Sarah and I'm gonna go jump right into it because I have five minutes. Um, I'm gonna tell you, tell you about the best event on FIU campus. It's called FIU Language Day. And I'm gonna share, you, share with you how we structure our FIU Language Day, but more than anything during this presentation, I really want to um, encourage you to reach out to me because there's a lot of information I won't be able to go into detail because I have five minutes. Um, but also I'd like to collaborate with you. How can we take our special event at FIU Language Day um, and make it more of a global event? So maybe we can have a language conversation group between your university and our university. Um, so we do FIU Language Day and we have a series of different events happening at the same time in the library on one specific day. Um, it's an annual event, it's an opportunity for, and we, we market it as an opportunity for students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the general public to practice their language skills in a non-threatening environment and fun environment. Um, one of the events that we have is language conversations. So the student or faculty member, they walk into the room, they pick a question, and we connect them with the language partner. Their name tag has their name and also the languages they want to practice. And the point of this is to try to engage them in conversation outside the classroom and also to make lifelong connections with other people. And the reason we started doing FIU Language Day was for multiple reasons. One of them was to create community within the library, to, to have a, create a buzz around the library beyond our great resources and uh, services. Um, so these are some of the language conversation starters. If you would like, I have a whole pile of them. If you'd like me, for me to share them with you, I'd be happy to. 
Another event we have is karaoke. Um, students love to sing. This is one of our quotes from our karaoke sessions. Um, they got to sing in their second language. Oftentimes, the karaoke goes way beyond um, the time we have set up for the day. Um, in the online event, when we moved online, the reticent students were very grateful to share their talents. It's more of an open mic. They sang or they read poetry for us um, or told us a story, but they said they would never ever have done it in person. Another event we have during this day is language and culture trivia. Cahoots works very well both online and in person. And I have a bunch of trivia questions. I won't go over them now in the interest of time. Um, but if you'd like our trivia questions, I would be happy to share them with you. Um, we get them from the Modern Languages Department as well as our Fulbright Scholars, and we also come up with some on our own. The other event that we have during this day is pop-up speakers. This is where we invite students to talk about their language experience um, for five to seven minutes. At first, we started doing this event in 2015. At first, I thought, oh, we'll never get pop-up speakers to do this. But now we have more pop-up speakers than we have time slots for. Because students really do want to engage with each other and share how language or culture has impacted their, maybe their ability to get an internship or a job and um, maybe do study abroad. Um, and this is a comment that we could receive from one of the students. We also have student uh, tabling, the student organizations table, and they share their food, their language, their culture, their games um, with others. If you are interested in doing creating the best event on your campus, maybe you want to call it your university language day. Um, we do ours during International Education Week because there's a lot of events going on during International Education Week, and it's an opportunity to get free promotion from those other events. Um, I recommend doing it in the library, um, various locations if you're going to do all these different events in one day. However, maybe you want to start small, reach out to potential partners. Um, we use a LibGuide to promote our events and share all the happenings that are, that are going on. Um, I am a big component of promoting word of mouth. Um, in fact, this past year, Elvis was spotted in the library promoting FIU Language Day. Um, and with that, um, you can create partnerships. In the beginning, we reached out to all of these different uh, partners within FIU, um, but now I find that they reach out to us and they want to be a part, they want to have a table at FIU Language Day. They want to share what they have with the rest of the community at FIU. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, please 30 please seconds. Me. Um, this, we can make this a global event. And with that, um, you can go to library.fiu.edu slash FIU Language to learn more. And Elvis would like to say thank you. Thank you. So our next poster is, So You Want to Talk About Race During a Pandemic, Constructive Dialogue During Trying Times. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Charlene Martoni, and I come to you from Georgia State University. In 2018, the University at Albany published its five-year strategic plan, pledging to foster an inclusive campus climate. To facilitate this goal, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion developed nine climate committees, one of which was the University Library's Climate Committee. Made up of eight members representing various library departments, the committee was charged with creating ongoing professional development and programming in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. The University Library's Climate Committee initially drew inspiration from the One Book Movement to envision programming for the 2020-2021 academic year. As you can see from the timeline in our poster, this movement was initiated in 1998 in Seattle, Washington by Nancy Pearl, who at the time had served as executive director of the Washington Center for the Book in Seattle Public Library. In New Paltz, New York, I served on the board of a one book program prior to joining the University at Albany Libraries. Now, it is important to note that the committee had been making programming plans as the world entered the COVID-19 pandemic. The University at Albany transitioned to a remote learning model in March of 2020 in response to the widespread COVID-19 outbreak in New York State. This development occurred just one month after it was reported that students at the university had held a distasteful party, which they had termed a corona party, 
where video had been recorded depicting offensive imagery toward people of Asian descent. Not long after this, that May, protests took place throughout the boroughs of New York City in response to the murder of George Floyd by police officers. Protests followed within days in the capital region of New York State and around the world as well. That July, amidst a global pandemic and a racial reckoning, the committee chose to move forward with plans to develop a library-wide professional development initiative, selecting So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijoma Aluo as a central resource. We had determined that this text would provide foundational knowledge to aid participants in obtaining and practicing competencies necessary for critical reflection and discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The Climate Committee led a group read over Zoom beginning in the fall of 2020, continuously serving participants for feedback. I'm Jody Boyle. I'm the Supervisory Archivist at the University of Albany State University of New York. Overall, our Climate Committee's programming has been a success. Library administration supported the program, providing funds to purchase copies of So You Want to Talk About Race. Survey, surveys demonstrated that Zoom was a hit with participants. They loved the small breakout rooms, which helped foster dialogue, and being on Zoom allowed us to safely bring all employees together during the pandemic to participate. And our committee encouraged all levels of participation, from those who wanted to sit quietly and observe to individuals who felt more comfortable speaking up. Our committee noticed quickly that not all participants read everything before discussions, so we shared more general question prompts with moderators in advance so all breakout room members could engage should they choose. Finally, our committee adapted to survey feedback in real time. For example, we incorporated videos and interactive polling into discussions as a direct result of participant comments. Now, launching and sustaining our group read program during the COVID-19 pandemic was not ideal, and despite these highlights, we encountered challenges. Zoom has a downside. We were intentionally engaging in uncomfortable conversations, but on Zoom, it's hard to gauge facial expressions or read body language, even with cameras on. Although our dean encountered, uh, encouraged participation and allowed employees to read materials during work, the nature of some employees' jobs did not make this easy. Clerical employees in particular expressed concern in the surveys about their ability to secure, secure time to participate. As a graph in our poster indicates, event attendance decreased over time, while a, gr a regular group attends our seconds. our other attendees vary. Our successes, however, sustained the program, and the committee conducted a second group read in fall 2021, centered on a mind spread out on the ground by Indigenous author Alicia Elliott. The committee is now enacting our 2022 plans. This past spring, we read smaller informative text, few short videos, and held mandatory training all related to the theme of bias, rather than focusing on a single larger text. The committee is considering a return to a larger group read next fall. Thank you for a more detailed information about our programming. Please visit either my or Charlene's speaker profiles, access the personal website icon, and consult the newsletter we created. Thank you. So our next poster is Zoomed Out, how burnout was associated with effect personality and job satisfaction among library employees during the pandemic. Good afternoon, welcome to Zoomed Out. Allow me to introduce my co-presenters, Barbara M. Sorondo from UM, myself, Christopher M. Jimenez, and you already know Sarah J. Hamill from FIU. Next slide, please. So we examined the um, effect uh, personality, job satisfaction, and burnout among library employees during the transition to remote work due to the 2020-2021 coronavirus pandemic. So we have definitions that, that will show up here on the screen here for the four constructs, that is affect, um, personality, job satisfaction, and remote work. Um, these are fairly self-explanatory, just uh, note that affect um, is a fancy word for emotions or your feelings. During the early days of the pandemic, the varied interactions previously occurring across classrooms, conference rooms, offices, staff lounges, cafes, and other meeting spaces transformed into endless Zoom sessions. 
Many library employees consequently noted feeling greater stress and fatigue, potentially leading to burnout. Now we measured how burnout related to affect personality, job satisfaction, and various char characteristics among library employees during the initial transition to remote work. And to explain our methodology, I will turn this over to Sarah Hamill. Oops. Oh, shoot. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so all 130 library employees at a large urban research university were invited via email to take a Qualtrics survey on how burnout relates to affect, personality, and job satisfaction. The survey had four established measures for four constructs presented randomly. It also included uh, questions about Zoom use, both professionally and personally, and a demographic questionnaire. The four constructs were effect, we use the positive and negative effect schedule, which measures a positive effect and negative effect separately. For personality, we use the big five inventory, which measures introversion, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, eroticism, and openness separately. For job satisfaction, we use the brief index of effective job satisfaction, which measures job satisfaction. And for burnout, we use the Bergen Burnout Inventory 9, which measures exhaustion, cynicism, inadequacy, summed up for a single burnout score. Now I will turn it over to Barbara Sarando, who will talk about our results. Thank you, Sarah. Of the 130 employees eligible to participate in the study, 54 or 42% chose to participate. They were roughly evenly divided between service area, meaning public services versus technical services, and also by employee status, defined as faculty versus staff. We used SPSS to conduct Pearson correlations and ANOVAs or analyses, and we found that employees spent approximately one to five hours in Zoom meetings each week. Faculty spend significantly more time in Zoom meetings than staff. Faculty about one to five hours per week with staff about an average of less than one hour. There was, however, no difference in time spent in Zoom meetings by service area. Next slide, please. Thank you. We also found that burnout level was not significantly correlated with time spent in Zoom meetings, service area, or employee status. Instead, burnout was significantly negatively associated with the variables of job satisfaction, positive affect, agreeableness, and conscientiousness, meaning that the greater reported burnout, the less reported job satisfaction and the other variables. On the other hand, burnout was significantly positively associated with the variables of negative affect and eroticism, meaning that the greater reported burnout, the greater reported levels of these variables. Burnout was not associated with either introversion or extroversion or openness. Overall, therefore, we found that time spent in Zoom meetings during the first year of the coronavirus pandemic varied by employee status, but not service area, which signifies that there were very different pandemic experiences for library employees based on their employment status. Burnout was not associated, however, with time spent in Zoom meetings, showing that the data did not support anecdotes of feeling, quote unquote, zoomed out. Burnout, however, was associated with various individual characteristics. Overall, the format of work, whether on-site or remote, was not associated with burnout. And the implication of this is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution for work mode in this coronavirus environment, suggesting that employees should be allowed to select their preferred work mode whenever possible. By matching employees' unique personalities and characteristics to their preferred work environments, we may help them avoid burnout, creating happier and healthier workplaces. Please see our poster in the poster hall for much more details on our study and feel free to ask us questions. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next poster is Citizen Science Education in Slovak Research Library, a case study from Central Europe. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, dear attendees of the IATUL Conference 2022, Welcome to my presentation of Poster Citizen Science Education in Slovak Research Library, case study from Central Europe. I'm Zuzana Stožicka, and in the name of my colleagues from Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information, I would like to present you a short account of how our institution as a national scientific library promotes citizen science in Slovakia. I would uh, begin with introducing our institution, Slovak Center of Scientific and Technical Information. It was founded uh, in 1938 as an academic library of Slovak Technical University, uh, but uh, during the second half of 20th century, it was detached from the university and started to perform additional functions beside classical library services. 
uh, for all scientific disciplines and the whole academic community in Slovakia. Uh, it is responsible for management of electronic information resources and scientific databases for Slovak consortium. Uh, popularization of science. Uh, it also covers uh, complex information systems for science research and education, as well as patent library or a contact point of uh, horizon schemes. Our team represents uh, the contact office for open science. We advocate, promote, and educate on open science. We do courses, webinars, workshops, and local events on open science and scholarly communication. And we also helped uh, to create Slovak national strategy for open science in participation with our academic community. We also mentioned citizen science in this document. Uh, a few uh, words about our country, Slovakia, uh, which is a beautiful small country in the heart of Europe with a lot of natural and human potential, but also significant historical burdens, such as a long experience with life behind the Iron Curtain and regime changes, which uh, complicated the development of civil society. So the heritage of socialism is still felt strongly, and also the ideological frictions between Eastern and Western culture. Uh, our scholarly ecosystem consists of 34 institutions of higher education as universities, colleges, with uh, some of about uh, uh, 100, uh, uh, thousand uh, students and 11,000 teachers or staff. And also there is Slovak Academy of Sciences, which has 70 research organizations, nine research libraries and 55 academic libraries. So we have a lot of institutions, uh, however, they're insufficiently supported and we can observe uh, low salaries, low, low respect in society, and also heavy burden of bureaucracy in this environment. Uh, and rigid, uh, rigid structures with a result in uh, intensive brain drain. So the best students and young scientists go abroad for decent working conditions and opportunities to develop. Uh, also, we can observe a low public interest in science or lower than average in Europe or in comparison with our neighboring uh, Czech Republic. Um, we can see that public image of scientists in Slovakia uh, suffers from some negative connotations from socialism or early capitalism or populism. And also uh, there are almost no incentives for scientists uh, in the system of evaluation to engage with public. Uh, scientists which do this uh, are doing it only uh, from their free will and uh, get almost no reward for this. Also, there is a lack of communication training at the universities. Uh, this communication gap between academic community and the public has also consequences. For example, in the COVID pandemic, a lot of people in Slovakia didn't get vaccinated just because they fell victims to misinformation. Uh, our country has also lowest research and development expenditure in the European Union. And it creates a kind of vicious circle. Slovak scientists struggle to survive. And uh, in the present situation, they have quite a limited means uh, to increase their visibility. But uh, they would not get better funding before they prove uh, quality and importance of the science to the public. Because without uh, the positive opinion of public, they won't. Uh, 30 seconds. Get... Oh. It goes so fast. So uh, forward, uh, citizen science is not widely known in Slovakia. Uh, and what we try to do to make it better, uh, we make informations available. Uh, we have a web page with a list of citizen science project. Uh, we also made a course on a European platform. Let's start with citizen science. And in this course, we have uh, 12 uh, citizen science project and the representatives on the videos, uh, which um, should inspire other scientists to join uh, participatory research. And uh, our aim is to make a supportive network for citizen science. Uh, recently, we started to involve academic and scientific li libraries, and uh, we are trying to make project with them translate uh, library guide citizen science for research libraries, uh, make a 
workshop uh, where the librarians and faculty can try and practice uh, uh, engaging in citizen science and also build some library kits inspired uh, by the library kits in size starter. So uh, we would like to make libraries uh, centers of citizen science and um, we hope they may become facilitators of progress and democratization of science while gaining visibility, contacts, and societal impact. Uh, we know that citizen science uh, would not solve all our problems, but it helps to create a supportive environment uh, for the development of positive relationships between uh, the academic community and the public, and also it brings advantages to all the stakeholders. So now I'm I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, you can contact me or my colleagues, uh, which are in person on a conference, Itka Dobersteinova and Josef Zivak. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd just like to remind everybody we're going to hold questions until the very end. Our next poster is Creating Polish Working Group of the Data Stewardship Competence Centers Implementation Network by the Gdansk University of Technology Library as an example of the community of practice building. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Magdalena from Gdansk University of Technology Library. And today, on behalf of my colleague, uh, Piotr Krajewski, uh, I would like to tell you uh, a little bit more about our new exciting uh, initiative is our Polish uh, working, um, working group. So um, our Polish working group of the Data Stewardship Competency uh, Center in Implementation Network, that's the very, very long, <laughs> long name, uh, is a part of the uh, international um, implementation network for uh, data stewards uh, run by a GoFair uh, organization. And uh, our Polish chapter, uh, which um, the coordinator of this Polish chapter is um, our uh, library director, uh, Dr. Anna Wałek, um, we launched our group at uh, December 2021 during our fifth Pomeranian uh, Open Science uh, Conference. Um, so at the moment, uh, our group um, uh, includes uh, more than uh, 70, uh, 70 members from uh, Polish uh, universities and also from Polish uh, research uh, institutions. And uh, we are not only um, data stewards, uh, we welcome librarians, IT uh, specialists and also administrative uh, staff. So uh, our main goals um, at the moment, it's uh, first of all is creating a network uh, of data stewards and other specialists, uh, which are engaged in different issues, different tasks according to uh, or related to uh, research data uh, management uh, in Poland. We also uh, wanted to provide uh, a space, a network for a discussion, exchange uh, different practices and uh, experience. Uh, we uh, collaborate with um, national and also international uh, open uh, research data uh, stakeholders. And uh, we try to support process of uh, implementation and introducing uh, fair principles um, in Poland. And um, also, in addition, uh, we are not um, exclusive to uh, research data management activities. We would like to promote all the open uh, science uh, pillars. So uh, our, at the moment, we use uh, basically our mailing list um, implemented on uh, Google. We also have uh, online meetings, one uh, per month, every uh, first Wednesday, uh, every month. Uh, we have uh, we sharing news conversations and for example um, helpful uh, and interesting links uh, via two uh, tools slack and uh, trello and we uh, just had uh, already one on-site meeting during our uh, seminar in Sopot. And uh, you can see uh, on our poster, you can see a picture of, uh, of us uh, from, uh, from Sopot. Um, 
Um, our network, I already told you, is over 70 people. Uh, and, but uh, during the on-site meeting, uh, we uh, met personally uh, in the group of 40 uh, librarians, uh, more than 40 librarians, uh, administrative staff, uh, and the IT uh, specialist. So what are uh, our future plans? Uh, first of all, we would like to um, be part of um, uh, of the community uh, who uh, is responsible or who is involved in creating and implementation of uh, research data management uh, policy uh, in Poland uh, at the first institutional and maybe later at the national level. Uh, we would like to provide uh, different educational resources for uh, Polish data uh, steward uh, communities for uh, researchers uh, and uh, other stakeholders. And also we would like to, as a group, we would like to participate uh, in the different events like um, conferences, uh, webinars, and also we are thinking about uh, writing some of the scientific uh, publications. Uh, thank you all. If you need more information um, or many, um, for example, any tips how to establish such a uh, such a group, uh, just don't hesitate and reach me uh, by my email. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to circle back around to see if the one person that was going to be here in person has actually joined us online. Uh, online. That's the academic library as meeting space. Story time for the recreational room of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. I, it doesn't look like we have them with us online, but um, hopefully we can get a recording of their presentation and upload that to Feed Loop. Uh, at this time, I would like to thank all of our presenters as well as the audience. If we have any questions from the audience, we will take those first. Thank you, Kim. Uh, hello, I do have a question for the um, the poster session about, so you want to talk about race. I, uh, I have a question asking um, how uh, your common reads has proceeded. Do you still choose something that is focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or is your program um, uh, more general? Um, I'd love to know a little bit more about that. Thank you for the question. We we do still focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion because that's the um, the purpose of the committee that was formed um, and is the the basis for our our group reads. So that the the themes may change, um, but um, the topics are always centered around DE, DEIA. That's great. We we also had that book in one of our uh, common reads, and it was it was such a great conversation starter. So that's good to hear. I have a question uh, to my colleagues from Slovakia. Uh, what is the interest in uh, citizen science between uh, a university staff and the community of, uh, of your uh, organizations? Hello, thank you for the question. Um, we don't have some um, measurements of this but uh, there is quite a good interest uh, in between the librarian staff. Uh, in the academical community, the scientists uh, often think uh, that uh, citizen science is uh, not as exact as uh, the traditional ways of research they are used to. Uh, but a lot of librarians are really interested in citizen science. Uh, we have um, we have uh, talked with about uh, fifty institutions, and uh, twelve of them uh, were interested in uh, our project, and uh, three of them will follow. So uh, you can see a lot of people are interested, but only a few of them want uh, to really engage in uh, some activities. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. I'm sorry, I do have one more question. Um, actually, for the citizen science and the Polish working group, both of your posters mention um, uh, open access. 
And I'd love to know more about how open access really supports your work and, and kind of what could be done to kind of help grow that as well. So role of, of open access in, in both of those uh, uh, both of those poster sessions. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I mentioned open science because uh, our Polish uh, working group is uh, mainly focused on um, research data management. However, uh, we uh, we didn't want to close only to that kind of activities. So at the moment, uh, we also discuss uh, via our uh, network uh, all the um, issues uh, which are um, connected to introducing Plan S and to uh, introducing um, uh, introducing uh, APC, introducing uh, introducing uh, APC uh, for a publication, which are covered by uh, our uh, grant uh, institutions such as uh, National uh, Science uh, Science uh, Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I do apologize. We actually did go a little over. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>